Amen. Good morning. How are we doing, church? Wow, that was more than three of you this week. It's spreading. Must have been that uh, what we fed you at the picnic the other day. By the way, great time. Uh, so thrilled to be there with you guys. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Luke chapter 24, 24th chapter of Luke's gospel. And, and we finally come to the very last chapter here in our study of Luke, Luke chapter 24. If you're new, uh, we would love for you to grab a Bible at the Welcome Center and consider that our gift to you. Now, uh, you guys have hung tough. Well done. It's been a tough month and a half or so getting through the crucifixion and, and all that meant to the history of humanity and to, to you and me personally. And now we, we get to reap the rewards of, of studying together now of the resurrection and the accounts of the risen Lord now among his people. So I'm excited for where we're at here. This is going to be a time, I believe, of, of great revelation and insight and rejoicing for this local body of believers here in the weeks ahead. Now, can't tell you how long we'll be in chapter 24. My hope is just a few weeks here, but we have to take care of some business right out of the gate here. And uh, let me unpack for you what I mean by that. Understand, friends, that every other religious system in the world ends right there in chapter 23, all right? Every world religion stops where we stopped in chapter 23. Their their leader, their founder, whatever you want to call them there, they die, and it's pretty much over. But that's not the case for us now, is it? Because he has risen. The resurrection is what separates all religious systems from Christianity, and it is really the the cornerstone of why we believe what we believe. It it is impossible to overstate uh, the importance of the resurrection to the believer. Everything that we believe, the gospel itself, understand, hinges upon the resurrection. And so we probably need to get on the same page here uh, concerning exactly what the resurrection means to you and I before we press much further. What what does it mean? Well, it means that Christ is alive, right? It, It means that he has conquered death. It means he is who he said he is. He, he said he would die for our sins and that he would be raised again unto life, that you and I might one day be raised unto life again as well. The resurrection is proof that Jesus is who he said he was. The, the resurrection is proof that what he accomplished on that cross took all right, that it stuck, that it was accepted by the Father as the sufficient sacrifice paying for your sin and for my sin and and indeed all of humanity's sin who would receive him. In other words, if Jesus didn't get up from that grave, that would mean you and I are still dead in our sin. 1 Corinthians 15. The resurrection, it is the cornerstone and the foundation of the gospel. If you are to be saved, you must believe in the resurrection. Take a look at this familiar verse. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, typically we focus on the confess and believe and be saved, right? But this verse tells us confess and believe in what? The resurrection. That he was raised from the dead. And so understand, it is the resurrection that completes our salvation. Now, not only will our spirits go to eternal glory with the Lord, but we will have, we will be furnished with a glorified body suited for that eternal experience. We'll catch a glimpse of that in our text. And it is in that sense, friends, that the Bible talks about Jesus as a kind of first fruits of the resurrection to come for all of us, that that he went before us and he conquered death, that it is his resurrection that guarantees our resurrection. It, It was he who said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. It was he it was he who said, Because I live, you shall live also. And so it is the resurrection that has always been the hope of the people of God, right? And it it is the resurrection 
Not only that has always been the hope of the people of God, I think it's important to see in the book of Acts, it is the resurrection that has always been preached. From Peter's very first sermon in Acts chapter 2, we see the theme of the resurrection resonating throughout the book of Acts, culminating finally in the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul's testimony that he had seen personally the risen Christ. And so again, every other world religion out there, without exception, kind of stops there in chapter 3, right? There he was, he lived, and he died, and that's all she wrote. But again, not for us. Not for us. We have a chapter 24. Now, the resurrection... The fact that Christ has been raised from the dead, this, of, of course, is of such import that we have attestation um, to the reality of it in all four gospel accounts. We've got the first 12 verses here in Luke chapter 24 that we're going to read together in total in a minute. We've got the first eight verses of Matthew 28, the first eight verses of Mark 16, and the first nine verses of John chapter 20. And after those verses in those respective Gospels, uh, we begin to get into the initial appearance of uh, the risen Christ. And we'll get into that in the weeks ahead. It's going to be fascinating material. Now, in these accounts, in all four of these accounts, we don't have the actual resurrection itself described because no one was there, right? Right? We don't find some kind of flashy description with with all kinds of special effects and so forth. There's none of that. Nobody was there. What we have are four distinct attestations to the discovery of the empty tomb. The empty tomb. As someone once said, the world offers promises full of emptiness, but the tomb offers emptiness full of promises. Now, In the spirit of that, here's where I kind of want to sort of set the direction for uh, what I hope to accomplish today and and why I think it's important that we get to this before we unfold the rest of the chapter. Because understand, there's a whole number of directions in which we could take this text, and I'll get into what that means in a bit. All the cards on the table right up front here, all right? At verse by verse, as you might have gathered now, I pray, we want you to know. Christianity is an intelligent faith, right? We want you to know why you believe what you believe. That's very, very important to us here. And, and if you've been paying attention, you know that passion is at the birth, really, of, of the launching of this new student ministry. We want to prepare these kids to know why they believe what they believe. We want to equip them for the skeptics that are going to be marching in their direction once they're no longer under the same roof as mom and dad, right? But again... What we do behind and underneath all of that, it's really a a part of our DNA uh, in verse by verse. This is who we are. It's it's what we do on Sunday mornings. We're, We're a teaching church. We want you grounded in, anchored in what we know to be an intelligent, defensible faith, 1 Peter 3. And so if we want to really know why we believe what we believe, if, if we want to be grounded in that, anchored in that, well, then it all starts with the resurrection, doesn't it? Because without it, again, all, all we've got is a house of cards. And so what I want to accomplish today is give us a very firm foundation in this reality most important and behind and underneath all realities that are a part of the fabric of our faith. So so here's what we're going to do today. Here's the cards on the table part. We are going to walk through the four primary arguments against the reality of the resurrection, the the four primary theories that that secular skeptics have brought forth. Because look, if you're going to take down Christianity, this right here is where you start. You try and empirically disprove the resurrection. Understand that if you do that, you don't need to go any further, right? If you can dismantle the resurrection, if you can disprove the reality of what the text we're about to read is telling us, you can take down all of Christianity with you. Now, here's the problem. Nobody has ever been able to do that. Every individual has, who, who has undertaken and underscore a legitimate, sincere effort 
And by legitimate and sincere, I mean having the capacity to let what you discover steer your heart. Every individual who has taken a legitimate, sincere effort to debunk the reality of the resurrection, uh, from C.S. Lewis all the way to Lee Strobel, uh, professors, philosophers, genetic scientists, lawyers, they have all come to the conclusion that the resurrection happened. And so what I want you grounded in, uh, and so I want you grounded in, in the core, the, uh, the anchor of the most fundamental reality at the center of our faith, okay? And, and I want that for several reasons. Number one, uh, that you might be strengthened in your faith, okay? We all have these bodies of flesh, don't we? Number two, that you might be prepared to, 1 Peter 3.15, give a hope for the defense that is in you. And then number three, that man, boy, the rest of this chapter just begins to come alive to you and, and grip you with a kind of reality and a, and a kind of delight that, that you can only have with this degree of assurance and, and confidence. And, and that's what we're going to go after this morning. So as much as we can do that in our time today, I want to get after that. Let us endeavor to, to anchor our souls in the reality of the resurrection that the text is attesting to for your faith for your witness, and for your delight. All right? Okay, so let's get after it and go to work here. Here now is Luke's account of this pivotal Sunday morning, verse 1. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came. Now, who's they? They are, of course, the women in verse 55, right? The women that were following Jesus, standing at a distance from the crucifixion. Okay, so they, these women, came to the tomb bringing the spices. These were burial spices, which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Isn't it interesting? This is the first time in Luke's gospel we see Lord and Jesus put together. Hmm, after the resurrection. Very interesting. Verse 4, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men, these are angels, suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. You might have shining in your translation. This Greek word here for dazzling, uh, it's a word that is used to describe lightning. Uh, It it actually has the idea of a a movement to it. Man, I'm telling you, I look at this stuff and understand, this is the realm that you and I are headed for someday. I mean, this is where we're going. We don't think often uh, or or as frequently about eternity as we should, Colossians 3, 2, right? But I am telling you, every uh, descriptive um, uh, information or or data that we get concerning heaven or those who dwell in it, it's always a picture of beauty and and radiance. And and so that's what we're seeing here. And and it's where you you and I are going. And I want to, as often as I can, kind of lead us in the direction of, of thinking more about that. But when this kind of heavenly reality breaks into uh, the earthly realm, well, human beings get, uh, it, what, what, they break into fear, verse 5. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? And so here are these angels. And so I'm going to step away from the Bible for a minute because this is speculation. You know, the Bible says that, that angels long to look into our redemption, that they're very interested, they're very curious about what God is doing in us. And I, and I kind of get the feeling that, that one or both of these angels are like, he's told you about this at least five times. Why are you looking for a living body among the grave? Okay, so interesting discourse here, verse 6. He is not here, they go on, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, verse 7, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Understand, Christ has spoken very specifically about this resurrection over and over again, verse 9. And they returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, they were uh, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, also the other women with them, uh, were telling these things to the apostles. Here's, here's something interesting, verse 11. But these words appeared to them as nonsense appeared to whom? To the apostles. These words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. Now, now this tells us a couple of things. 
Number one, that our disciples, our, our boys aren't on board with the program yet. They're, they're not looking for the resurrection. They, they, they have not anticipated the resurrection. They, they don't understand what Christ has told them over and over again. But before we get too hard on these guys, for that matter, do, do we? I, I mean, we're here week in and week out pouring over the scriptures. And how is it? that we're living our lives. So something to consider. Second thing here is that a woman's testimony was not considered credible, not not allowed in a court of law. So I think these things uh, together, they weren't anticipating this. They weren't looking for it. They didn't quite get it yet. Along with the testimony of the women, somehow this came together in their hearts as, this is nonsense. I mean, you guys are mad, is really what the text is saying here in the Greek. Verse 12. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. So the women were right. We all figure that out sooner or later, don't we? Now, a little delayed reaction there. I hear a couple of amens out there, and they're not from the men. All right. Now, again, there's a whole lot of directions that we could take this passage, and one of those directions would be to try and harmonize all four of the Gospels in a kind of chronological order, and that can be done, but it would take no small amount of work for us to do that. Uh, There are times when harmonizing the Gospel accounts can be done very quickly with a tweak or two or an additional detail. This is not one of those times. And I'll get into that. What I am purposing to do here this morning is build a case upon that which they are all commonly attesting to, and that is the reality of the resurrection. Here's what you need to understand from the perspective of the skeptic. I understand they are almost, well, they're trying not to believe. And if that is your goal, then you you have abandoned the intellectual right to examine the evidence objectively. All right, here's what you need to know. The skeptics are going to come at the, the, the great variation in these, these four accounts, and they're going to attack either position. What, what do you mean by that? I, I mean this. All, if all four gospel accounts were exactly the same, they'd say, oh, well, they all colluded. You know, they tried to get their story straight, right? If they're all different, which they are in a number of respects, well, then they're going to say, well, well why are they different? I mean, isn't that contradictive? No, it is not. Listen. What we need to understand is that each gospel writer is writing to a specific audience with a very distinct theme, and each of these inspired accounts accord with those themes beautifully if you take the time to study that out. What you invariably discover when you look at these different accounts is you find a very natural description of all of the pieces to this puzzle. There's no kind of fumbling effort uh, to make everything somehow match. They are consistent with their respective themes and emphases, and when taken together, they give us a very wonderful and and complete chronology of the many moving parts you have in the story. You've got a number of women. You've got a number of different angelic appearances seen by different individuals. You've got several different trips to the tomb. You've got Peter and John racing to the tomb in one account. Uh, In John's account, of course, I, I, I find it interesting that John has to let us know that he can run faster than Peter in in his little editorial sidebar and his gospel. But at any rate, I think it's a wonderful exercise to get after on your own time to piece these accounts together. I'd be more than happy to um, forward you a few links with some very likely chronology scenarios. Uh, Just drop your email on a connect card uh, in the box along with a check for 10,000 bucks so I can hire Wilkinson. Okay. (laughs) And I'll be happy to get that right out to you. Of course, I'm kidding. I'll do that for five G's, yo. But again, but again, what I am purposing to do here is build an intelligent case that, that you can get a hold of and grab onto that argues for the very common and undeniable thread through it all, the very main point that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead. That's the end game. That's the meta narrative. That, that's the big picture of what all four gospel writers are going for. Now, having said all that, as we look at this, look, 
If you are going to be intellectually honest, which I believe you, of course, you have to do, right? I mean, you have to do something with this period of time that Luke is describing. Now, I I don't know if it ever really hit you, but do you understand that the objective historical evidence that, that something did, in fact, happen here is so strong that there has been just, just an incredible amount of secular scholarly research done here. Do we understand that? There have been volumes and volumes of research done, and entire exhaustive dissertations written. Is it not fascinating that such a heavily scholarly effort has gone forth over the years by people who have no intention of believing or worshiping Jesus Christ? Why? Again, because the objective historical evidence of these events that took place around the open tomb are so strong. You've got non-Christian historians, all right? Guys like Josephus, Gaius Plinius, Seleucius. These guys have all recorded, they have all recorded these things. You, You can't just write it all off is what I'm trying to say. And so they've tried to figure out a way, all right, these events, we've got to deal with them because the, the objective reality is so strong. Now, now, how is it, given that these events are undeniable, how is it that we can kind of reinterpret these events that we might oppose the resurrection? Are you with me? So the objective historical evidence that these things around the tomb have happened is so strong that secular scholars have had to try to figure out how to deal with it in such a way that they can reinterpret in order to oppose the resurrection. And so then, here are now the four dominant theories that have been put forth opposing the reality of the resurrection. And look, I'll just tell you up front, my card's on the table. They're all absurd. Now, maybe you're here and you're kicking the tires of Christianity and thrilled that you're here. Maybe you're thinking, absurd? Yeah, I think being raised from the dead is absurd. Well, okay, I'll give you that. But let's just see if it's more absurd than what I'm about to walk you through. Here are the four predominant secular theories around the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Here's the first one. They went to the wrong tomb. Now, you can giggle, and I'm okay with that. I didn't write it. But this wrong tomb theory here, it is predicated upon the idea that these women who were following Jesus were so emotionally upset, so distraught and hysterical, that in their intense grief, they, they just showed up at the wrong term, the tomb. Okay? Then, of course, verse 9, verse 12 there, when they went back and told the other guys, well, they told them about the wrong tomb, so Peter and John also ran to the wrong tomb. That's the theory. Now, okay, again, intellectual honesty, right? Don't know about you, but I've gotten lost before. Anybody else? Well, no, I got GPS, dummy. Good for you. But again, sincerely, I I don't have a problem with the obvious reality that this event was absolutely traumatic for these women. Again, in verse 1, you don't bring burial spices to a guy that that, that you think is going to rise from the dead. You don't bring burial spices uh, to a guy that you think is going to get up and walk out of there in a couple of days. They haven't put that together yet. And so no doubt there's just a great deal of trauma being experienced by these women. Now, Here is, however, how this first theory utterly breaks down. If they went to the wrong tomb, well, then as Christianity began to spread, right, which is precisely what the the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, precisely what they were trying so hard to prevent. But if they went to the wrong tomb, as this thing is being spread, wouldn't they have just rolled out the body? All right, morons, look, you just went to the wrong tomb. Here's the body right here. But they didn't do that, did they? Why? Because there was no body to be found. They could have killed that by rolling out the body. Wrong tomb? Oh, okay, here it is. End of Christianity. Didn't happen. Theory number two. The second theory is, is that Jesus' followers were so filled with grief that they hallucinated his resurrection. Now, one or two people, maybe, I don't know. Maybe they didn't sleep, right? Some of us have been around traumatic loss, have we not? Maybe they drank a little too much wine. 
You know, maybe they stumbled in some peyote or something. I don't know. But again, if we're honest, people have been known from time to time to have hallucinations after a traumatic loss. I saw grandma there sitting at the bedpost. I mean, there's some degree of precedent for that. But here's the problem. Jesus appeared in his resurrected body, not just to one guy over here and another guy over there, but Paul tells us he appeared to hundreds of people at one point to over 500 people at once. In fact, Paul told the church at Corinth, look, these eyewitnesses, yo, check it out, they're still alive. Okay, they're there. So it was, a, it was a kind of open challenge. Look, hundreds of people have seen him at once. They're still alive. They're walking around all over the place. Just go and ask them for yourself. Paul puts that out there knowing that no one could refute it. The problem is this. There is no precedent. There is no evidence whatsoever supporting group hallucination. It just doesn't exist. There's no evidence that two or three people can have the same hallucination, let alone over 500 at once, right? And here is the risen Christ. We know that for 40 days he ate with them, right? He walked with them. Then after the ascension, the hallucinations just stop. And so, again, it's an absurd theory. You're trying to put some kind of weight. That's a styrofoam plank that you're trying to put your weight on. There's no weight there at all. There is no evidence nor will there ever be, scientifically, for group hallucination. Now, the third theory, and this is the one that's, that, that has had the most traction over the last couple hundred years, is, is called the swoon theory, not the swan theory, the swoon theory. And, and the swoon theory is this, that Jesus, having been severely beaten and then hanging there on the cross and under such intense pain that he somehow blacked out, due to the loss of blood and the shock and so forth, and, and that later on in the, in the cool, dry, damp air there in the tomb, he, he somehow revived and just got up and walked out of there. Now, again, it, if we're being historically honest, there is some degree of precedent for this. Now, we've got a lot of information about people who were mistaken for dead and buried alive, right? In fact, we've excavated a number of Civil War graves and found evidence of a number of post-burial struggles uh, that, that had to have taken place in the grave, you know, hair being pulled out of the head, fingernails scratching onto what, yeah, pretty gruesome stuff, not sure why I mentioned that. Um, but you can see where there might be a bit of traction um, to this, that, that Jesus somehow came back to life and just kind of bucked up and pulled himself together there. But here's where objective evidence would suggest quite a stretch here. How did Jesus, in this weakened condition, I, I mean, he's, we know what, he's severely dehydrated, he's been up over 24 hours, hadn't slept this much we know, uh, he suffered tremendous blood loss, he's had lacerations so severe uh, that the Bible tells us that you could not recognize his form as even being human, he was beaten to within an inch of his life. How does a human being in this weakened condition move a stone that no scholar would debate weighed anywhere from two to 4,000 pounds? Well, David Friedrich Strauss is not a Christian. He is a secular historian. Now, again, I always want to elevate intellectual honesty, even if that puts pressure upon what we believe as Christians. I just think we've got nothing to fear, Right? Because all truth is God's truth. We are of Christ. Christ is of God. We've got nothing to hide from. All right? Here's what Strauss says about the swoon theory. Quote, It is impossible that a being who had stolen half dead out of the sepulcher, that's the tomb, who crept about weak and ill, wanting medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, who still at last yielded to his sufferings, could have given the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death in the grave, the prince of life. That seems to be quite impossible. And, and so Friedrich... Our boy Strauss here, he is saying there is no way in the world that a man who had his flesh ripped off his back and a, a spear shoved up under his rib cage, puncturing his heart, five and seven inch nails nailed through his rib. There is no way a man in this condition, even if he did faint, could have moved a two ton stone, crawled out of that grave, and then gave his disciples the impression that he had conquered death as the prince of life. Look, 
even secular historians would say, certainly can't be that. I mean, it just can't be that. It's not within the realm of reason. Now, the nail in the coffin to the swoon theory, in fact, underneath and, and before all of this, is we know he was, in fact, dead, right? It's why the soldiers didn't break his legs. Here it is right here. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out, oh, blood and water. Now, why the blood and water? Medically speaking, if the spear comes up and punctures the heart and the lungs and is then pulled out, what you're going to have is called pericardial effusion around the heart where there's this layer of of liquid that that protects the heart muscles against friction. And then you're going to have what's called pleural effusion, uh, effusion, pleural effusion, which comes from the pleural cavity, which is a layer of clear fluid that allows your lungs to expand and contract. Saying all that to say this, what it would look like to you and I is blood and water. Look, Jesus was dead. All right, they took him down, they wrapped him, they put him in the tomb. There was no doubt in the minds of the men who were handling this that they were dealing with a dead man. And so the swoon theory, very paper thin, very flimsy. It's almost like a person is trying not to believe at this point. But again, it's the idea that had the most traction, along with the final predominant theory here now, number four, that the body itself was stolen. That the body was stolen. Now, why this theory is so wildly popular is, uh, for so long, is, I have no idea. But, of course, the theory is that the disciples stole the body, because nobody would think the religious leaders stole the body of Jesus, right? That's just going to promulgate their worst fear. They'd produce it in a heartbeat to kill it. But the theory is that the disciples stole the body of Jesus and then made up the whole story of the resurrection in order that they might further their master's teaching. Here's a couple of reasons why this is another plank that can't hold any weight, okay? Number one, the disciples themselves are painted as pretty incompetent guys in all four of the Gospels. So much so, in fact, so much so are they painted as incompetent that if somebody said to me, come on, man, surely the Bible's been tampered with. I'm saying surely it hasn't because if it it was, they they would have taken a whole lot out, right? The the Bible just very honestly outs these guys as incompetent, cowardly morons, right? It it, it just does. Have you ever really paid attention to what you're reading in some of these accounts? Jesus is telling a parable. They're all going, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they pull away, and they're looking at each other. Man, I don't have any idea. Do you have any idea? I don't have, a, I mean, you're throwing some seeds in the weeds. Choke. I mean, do you guys know what this means? And Jesus has to say, are you serious, guys? All right, all right. You know, this is given for your understanding. Let me roll this out for you. Now, what we know at this point in our story is that every one of these guys with the exception of John for a period of time, every one of these guys, they, they've bolted. They have fled the scene. These coward they've already run away, all right? I mean, they don't get at all what's going on here. Verse 11 in our text shows us that they think this is all nonsense. It gets better. Now, understand that these men, mind you, they have no special skills whatsoever except maybe fishing, Right? And so according to this theory, these incompetent, cowardly men who have no special skills, these guys suddenly become SEAL Team 6, right? I mean, they, they somehow put masks on and figure out how to drug the Roman guards and, and you know, open the tomb, get, get the stone roll, steal his body, put it back. And, and yet, and here, here's where it gets really interesting. Pay attention. Knowing they stole the body... Knowing that they stole the body, they are still willing to have their own bodies tortured and killed to protect the story. Every one of these guys is tortured. Everyone except one is killed. And no one breaks. No one caves. No one. 
James and Paul have their heads chopped off. Tradition tells us Peter was crucified upside down. John was boiled in a vat of oil before exile to the the island of Patmos. Uh, Thomas, uh, Matthew both had swords and spears thrust through their body because they wouldn't recant. Do you understand that? They were given a chance to recant, but no one broke. No one caved. For a story you made up? Really? Well, maybe they did it for money or power. Oh, oh yeah, good one. Because that's what was going on when they were getting slaughtered and killed and fed to the lions. There is a lot of money and power to be had by a marginalized minority in an empire that hated them. Again, aren't we just trying not to believe now? Listen to me. Every single one of these theories around what happened in the resurrection, they, they can't bear any weight, and, and you need to know that. They are styrofoam planks. They're so incredibly fragile and flimsy. You, you cannot put any degree of, of empirical or intellectual or any kind of integrous weight on them whatsoever before they crumble. Now, the biblical evidence itself, the hundreds of prophecies fulfilled, Jesus himself letting these guys know at least five times exactly what was going to happen. We haven't spent a lot of time on that today because that's what we do week in and week out, right? As far as the direct historic evidence is concerned, there has been such an abundance of it that, again, secular scholars have had to come up with a number of ways to deal with it precisely because of the abundance of it. I think as we've demonstrated here very briefly this morning, I get that, that every one of these theories that try to somehow explain away the resurrection by by modern-day empirical historical standards, I I think they're absolutely absurd. They, They don't hold any water at all. And so we have overwhelming biblical evidence, just a ton of direct historical evidence, and then I think we have just a ton of circumstantial historic evidence that when taken together, the circumstantial historic evidence, when taken together with the evidence we've just mentioned, provides a very compelling set of inferences supporting what we've read in Luke today. So let's just mention a couple of those historical circumstantials before we move to close, and then we'll talk about what all this means. Now, uh, just... uh, just a, a brief primer. What is circumstantial evidence that we're about to talk about? So um, I see Mike go into Cal's house, and, and I, I see him shoot him with a gun and drop him dead. That, that is direct evidence. Now, if I see Mike walking in, cussing like a drunken sailor, waving a gun, walking into Cal's house, but then the door closes and I can't see, I hear a very loud shotgun sound, I hear a big thud because Cal's a big dude, right? And and then I see Mike leaving the scene, waving this gun in his hand, cussing with blood all over his shirt. Now, I haven't seen the murder, but that's that's what's called circumstantial evidence. The circumstances would point to a very high probability and an inference that, in fact, what happened, happened. Now, in a court of law, individual pieces of circumstantial evidence aren't enough to convict. But when you get enough of them on top of one another, corroborating one another, then, then they become stronger and stronger. So we've already established biblical evidence, direct observational evidence, so much so that these guys had to figure out how to deal with it. Now I want to talk to you about some of the circumstantial historical evidence. The first one comes from our text this morning here in Luke. Uh, All four of the Gospels, in fact, very explicitly tell us that these women were the first witnesses to the empty tomb. All right? What you need to understand here, again, as unfortunate as this was, but it was the case, understand that in the first century, a woman's testimony was not considered to be credible. In fact, the testimony of a woman was not recognized or allowed even in a court of law. So it means, Tonda, if you saw Mike take out Cal, Mike's not going to jail. It's unfortunate, but it was the case. Now, somebody tell me, all right, somebody tell me if you were making this story up, all right, Why would you make up the story so that the first witnesses to the empty tomb were the very people whose testimony wouldn't be allowed in a court of law? 
Why would you do that? Well, you wouldn't. They didn't make the story up. Number two, as we've already said, the Bible doesn't paint these disciples as the sharpest pencils in the box, all right? They are not the brightest candles on the cake. And I wish we had more time, but, but let's just look at Peter alone. Here's cowardly Peter back there in Luke chapter 22, if you can remember. I am not going to deny you. I don't care if I have to die. I will not betray you. And Jesus goes, uh, yeah, bro, look, uh, before the alarm goes off in the morning, three times. A few hours go by. Weren't you with Jesus? Nope, don't know him. No, no, you, you have a Galilean accent. I, I'm telling you, I don't know. But I saw you with him. Blankety, blankety. Blank. I mean, Peter, I, this dude went nuts. He lost his mind. Now, what happened to this guy, right? Something happened to this guy because 60 days later at Pentecost, this guy gets up and preaches his guts out. It, it enrages the power brokers. They threaten the guy, eventually beat the guy. He gets right back up on the horse. What happened to Peter? I mean, when did he get so big chested, right? When did he get all yoked up? and ready to roll, right? Because up to this point, he was a coward. The resurrection happened. This man was transformed, participating in the resurrection, participating in that resurrected life. And so were all of these other men. It happened. And then lastly, and we'll try to wrap this up, and I've always loved this one. And this is yet... Another, there are several more that we don't have time to cover, but here's yet another compelling layer of circumstantial historic evidence. Here it is. How do you get your own family to believe that you are God? I mean, how do you pull that off? I mean, have you ever thought about that? Some of you know his half-brother James became the pastor of the Jerusalem church, and he too, by the way, was martyred and killed for not recanting his faith. But how did that work? I mean, can you imagine trying to pull that off? I go to Chicago for Christmas. My brothers come up to me, hey, Johnny, it's good to see you. And I go, no, no, not Johnny. I am the son of God. I, I just don't think you can pull that off. And if you can... It's more likely that the problem is with your family members, right? James not only believes his half-brother whom he grew up with, but he was willing to go to his death for it. What did he see to believe that? Do you understand that? I mean, no, I'm sure that childhood had to be strange, right? There's Jesus' report cards on the fridge. got straight A's all the way across. Right? It had to be weird growing up with a brother that never sinned. You're the one that's getting in trouble. You're, 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 the, you're the only one standing in the corner. The butt of little Jesus never saw the palm of Joe's hand, right? I would imagine there must have been a whole, and based on what I've got from my kids, that there's a whole lot of resentment building up over the years. But James had observed him firsthand for years. Pretty unique position to be in. And in the end, James not only believes his half-brother was the son of God, but he's willing to be thrown off the top of the Temple Mount and beat to death with clubs before recanting. Now, what are we supposed to do with that? That's yet more historical, circumstantial evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Understand all of the evidence, and it is extensive. We have just scratched the surface here this morning. I would encourage you to go further. It's, it's fun. It's wonderful. It will build up your ability to give a defense for the hope that is in you, 1 Peter 3.15. Biblical evidence, we've got archaeological evidence, we've got historic evidence, and then we've got a ton of historic circumstantial evidence taken together, friends. There is just a mountain of evidence corroborating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if a person is going to stand on, on the other side of all this, understand that they are putting their weight on styrofoam planks. My prayers, we've demonstrated that. Now, as, as we land the plane here, I, I think this has profound implications for, for you and, and, and me as a, a Christian. Again, you need to understand our faith is an intelligent faith. It, it, it's not ethereal, all right? It's not whimsical. It's not an analogy. Well, Christ got up when he was down so we could get It's none of that at all, 
All right? We believe that Jesus Christ was literally and physically murdered, that he allowed that, that he was in the grave from Friday to Sunday, and that on Sunday morning he physically resurrected from the grave. We believe that. We have embraced that. And now I, I, I pray to some greater degree you understand that this is an intelligent, defensible, supportable reality, and the alternative is absurd. Now, what, what, what does that reality mean to you and I? Well, it means everything, all right? It means that, that our sins are legitimate, needed to be handled, and that they were completely handled in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that means now, that means that your sin and my sin is a very, very serious thing, that it required the life of Jesus Christ. And it means that the resurrection is evidence that the bill has been paid in full. My prayer is that this, all of this has been made a little bit more real and present to you today, that, that you and I would look at this and we would endeavor to do something about it. And I don't mean work. I don't, I don't mean sweat. I don't mean strife. I mean trust. And I mean rest. I mean embracing the, the full spectrum of freedom and delight that the reality of the resurrection means to you and me. Guys, this is real. So real. We are not seeking the living among the dead. No. Again, the word of God is always putting humanity in one of two camps. Right? We talked about this. There's the justified, and to borrow from John 5, the damned. There's the saved. There's the lost. The decided, the undecided. The wheat, the tares, the sheep, the goats. We could go on, right? Every human being is, is put by the word of God in one of those two camps. Now, here is the challenge to each group. If you have not confessed Jesus Christ as the answer to your sin problem and believe that he was raised from the dead, my prayer is that, information will, that this information will be used by the Spirit of God to press you into a decision. There is not only overwhelming biblical evidence, there's a ton of both direct and circumstantial historic evidence that when taken together, assuming you investigate this on your own, you're going to discover you you really have to to try not to believe. I, I am telling you, undecided individual, that God deeply, deeply loves you that he deeply, deeply wants to forgive you. And it does, listen to me, it does not matter what you've done, but you don't know what I've done. You, you don't, I, I don't need to know. No, you, you don't know what I've done. I, 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 again, I'm telling you, there are people in this church that probably make your sins look pretty junior varsity, like 4th Street tight end, right? It doesn't matter what you've done. But... Because God did not, I know this is another Bible study, but, but because God did not create you as a robot, man, you have to choose him, all right? Choose him today. I beg you, choose him today. Receive his uh, indwelling spirit and all these things that are a little bit cloudy to you, man. You will be given by his spirit understanding, John 16, 1 Corinthians 2. All you need is that mustard seed of faith, man, Matthew 17, right? He'll take care of the rest. That's his gig. My prayer is that what you've seen week in and week out here, along with what we presented today, that, man, surely that mustard seed is there. Make that leap. Cross that bridge. The the resurrection, man, that plank is solid oak. Now, For those of you that do believe, the challenge is twofold. To rest afresh, to rest anew once again in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and then to begin making it not about, this is for you, believer, to begin making it not about you, but about him. And this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about before we go home. Can we do that? Look, friends, listen. You were created far more than you are walking in. You were created for far more than you are walking in. When Jesus came, 
He, came, he, he, he said he came bringing the kingdom. He said that he was the king of the kingdom of God and that he was going to push back whatever was dark in the world. Therefore, listen. The more we make all of this about him, the more you and I will flourish as human beings. The more we make this all about us, the more we are robbed of joy, robbed of life, robbed of energy, robbed of a kind of vitality. You see, the the great irony of life in the day and age in which we find ourselves living is this. Our our mantra, right? our banner is this. Well, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, not understanding that the fruit of that is weariness and exhaustion and despair. The more you make the world about you, the more miserable, the more exhausted and and, and angry of a person you're going to be. Just understand that reality. And the more and more the world stops being about you, the more life, the more energy, the more joy there is to be had. And until you figure that out, believer, until you figure that out, you're you're not going to be satisfied. You're just not. Okay? You're going to keep going back to the well of the world for, after each temporary cycle of satisfaction kind of plays itself out. As long as you stay on that rat wheel, again, I'm saying you're getting ripped off, robbed. And so the challenge is, look, for the believer, look, how long will you settle for less? How long Will you persevere in holding back on, all right, Lord, I'm all in. Look, th- this is for real, all right? I, I, I hope in some small way that our time here today uh, has, made, has had the effect of making this more real and present for you. Anchor yourself in the resurrection. Settle it in your hearts. Respond to this invitation that is given to you, unto you every week. I want you to go all in because it's where you are filled with the greatest joy and the greatest vibrancy. And and where you don't, you won't. And so use this as a barometer. Anchor yourself in the resurrection. Respond to this invitation. Quit settling for less. Stop compromising. Say to yourself, man, this is where I want to go. This is where I need to go. I must be a part of the story. Final word for the undecided, and we'll go home. Final word for the undecided. Man, we want you with us. We're so glad you're here. All of us here and indeed all of heaven long for you to be part of this bigger story and and pushing back everything that is dark in the world. And so let me just exhort you, be a part of this story, not as a display of his justice, but as a trophy of his great grace and mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these men and women. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to just think about and dwell upon the reliability of your resurrection and what that means for us. Father, where we've made this about us, Lord, please forgive us. Help us to understand and trust your good and beautiful design to lead us unto human flourishing that you yourself might be glorified. Lord, for those of us who remain undecided and uncommitted, I I pray that by your spirit you would draw them to yourself, that, that God, I pray that you have used and, and anointed our time today as an instrument in exposing just the folly of the world's view of your truth, wherever they might be, God, in their hearts. I, I pray that you would just break through all of that skepticism today, that by your spirit you would bring forth the exercise of just that mustard seed of faith. I thank you that the resurrection shows us the bill has been completely paid. Thank you, God, that there is no sin with more power than the cross. Help us to make Jesus Christ our most supreme treasure in our lives. 
Help us to pursue, Lord, this relationship with you that was purchased so beautifully on that cross. It's for your beautiful name, I pray. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's worship.